everyone will live in penthouses in the sky, the most luxurious penthouses. They'll all have their own robots to look after their every needs. And the robots will emit incense and perfume. And, and everyone will be able to drink champagne every day. And no one will ever hurt each other. Oh, hi, I'm Chris. I was just describing what would happen if we implemented my ideas. What? You don't think it'll lead to a utopia where everyone has a million dollars in robot butlers? Then why do we believe it when a rich person says it? When I was half my age, I read all the books on how to get rich, from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm thinking of addressing in a future video, by the way, comment below if you think I should, to Think and Grow Rich. They say roughly the same thing, usually, and conclude that anyone can get rich. I've addressed that argument in another video, which you might want to watch, if you really think anyone and everyone can get rich. It's not about mindset and hard work and a bit of smart investing. Most people have no chance of ever getting rich. These books sell them simple answers and false hope. They sell imaginary capitalism. Hey, you want to know the secret of getting rich? You don't have to pay for a book or a seminar. I'm going to reveal it here for free. You ready? Hire people to do all the work. That's it. Hard work is for employees. Rich people own stuff. Name me one rich person who didn't get rich by owning things, or, you know, inheriting them. This video is about the myths, legends, and stories used to explain how those guys got rich. First, we'll talk about what capitalism is and how it came to dominate economic relations. Later, we'll hear about what capitalism is from the mouths of people who got rich. They weave fascinating tales about why they're so successful and awesome and good-looking. And it's never the full story. I've already told you the real story. They owned things. Work's not even required for many people to own things. They just have enough money or get financing. But that's not what the just-so stories of capitalism tell us. The capitalism that we all live under is a system where the businesses that produce everything are privately owned by a small minority of the population to make a profit. Capitalism has become the dominant economic system, and thereby political system, of our time, and it's spread pretty much all over the world. It shapes our environment our wants and needs, our relationships, our entire lives from start to finish. How did we get here? Depends who you ask. The myths of the origin of capitalism tend to involve some people working extra hard and accumulating capital, like the ant preparing for winter, and everyone else just didn't work as hard, like the grasshopper, and ended up with nothing. Yeah, that's not by any stretch of the imagination a take based in history. It's a myth used to justify the enormous inequalities of wealth and power that have been created over centuries by institutions of power like the law and the police and the corporation. The history of capitalism is a tale of criminalizing independent people and forcing them into factories. It took away their land, their means of subsistence, and their freedom, and forced them to engage in activities that brought in money, which for most of them meant working for the people who had all the money already, like the emerging capitalist class in their new factories and workshops. Owners went from owning feudal land, and thereby the people on that land, to owning businesses and renting their workforce from among an entire population desperate for money. Capitalism has meant the destruction of nature and of people to whom that nature was sacred all over the world, because 
people with money will do anything to get more. If you don't believe me, and frankly, why would you? I'm just some guy on the internet. There are books in the description you can read. Don't blame yourself for not knowing, though. It's a sign of how little history we're taught, and how many ahistorical assumptions we're taught in place of facts. In history class, we learn about events that supposedly shaped the so-called national identity we're expected to believe in. Not the trends and processes of history, and certainly not centuries of violence against slaves, peasants, workers, and colonized people to help the rich get richer. Today, along with a mythic past, we're supposed to believe in a glorious capitalist present. Capitalism provides all the things that we have, because capitalism is the dominant economic system. As such, it's also responsible for creating products designed to break and populate landfills. It's responsible for people living in the streets, as landlords kick people out of their homes because property rights are inherent to capitalism, but you don't own property. It's responsible for slavery in places like the Congo and the U.S. prison, where people make things we use every day because corporations will do anything if it helps the bottom line. Capitalism is rarely given a death toll like Stalinism is, so we assume capitalism has never killed anyone. They died on the job? They voluntarily signed up for the job. Well, no, no, they were coerced by a system that requires them to make money. They were never really given a choice. Millions die as a result of wars demanded by capitalists to expand their capital? Well, that's government. It's not the same thing. Except government and its violence have always been integral to capitalism. How would rich people protect and expand their piles without violence? That's how free the free market is. But none of today's biggest believers in capitalism know about any of these things, because they've been taught to think none of those things count as capitalism, even though they're the direct results of it. We're trained not to see things for what they are, or not to see them at all. To believe in the myths crafted for us in PR offices and textbook publishing houses. To its adherence, capitalism means if you just provide a service, the market will reward you. And rewards are based on how much value you create, so if you're rich, you must deserve it. And if you're poor, well, you should go back to school or something because you have only yourself to blame. Not the system that dominates every aspect of your life. I call this collection of assumptions imaginary capitalism. This kind of capitalism has never existed, and in fact probably could never exist, but we're taught to believe in it. Speaking of what's never existed, imaginary capitalism uses a number of adjectives to imply capitalism could be better, different, and not cause all the problems that are inherent to all capitalism. You hear a lot about crony capitalism, for instance. I think this tweet says it all. Prageru says crony capitalism is when the state gets involved. But the state has always been involved in capitalism, has made all the laws that created markets and corporations, and has always supported the biggest businesses and their owners. Which really means that all capitalism is crony capitalism, and we can drop the adjective. We get told about free market capitalism, which is an oxymoron, because again, the state is always involved, injecting its violence everywhere to ensure better outcomes for rich people and keep the workforce in line. Capitalism has never had free markets. It just gets bound up with the word free to sound better. Markets are characterized by monopolies and oligopolies because the violence that creates markets is implemented and enforced by law. Laws skew markets in favor of the biggest or best connected corporations, 
and the big fish always gobble up the little fish in the end. People are kept poor by having everything cost money and not making enough to cover their needs, so they have to keep going back to work, or steal, or both. You might even have heard of green capitalism, which, again, doesn't make a lot of sense. Capitalism requires the destruction of the environment, and in fact requires constant destruction of every environment that's been commodified or subjected to the market, because the businesses involved in the destruction are required to keep producing. What's green capitalism? Where you get rich by restoring old growth forests and replenishing fish stocks? As part of the gospel of capitalism, we're assured the best thing about the system is you and everyone else you know can get rich if you just play the game. Mm. This is the imaginary capitalist vision of heaven. You too can get rich, they promise. You just need good business sense, work smart, not hard, but also work hard, incorporate, don't take on too much debt, get a budget, save money, and follow your vision. The specific rules for getting into capitalist heaven vary with the preacher, but it's all some form of these suggestions, all of which you could have learned at a junior achievement seminar. Whatever you do, the system is perfect, so don't even think about changing it. Just change your attitude. You're the problem not the system you've been forced into. Imaginary capitalism is full of advice for ambitious, naive young people, but don't worry, poors, it's got advice for you, too. Money doesn't buy happiness. On an existential level, it's true. Money doesn't literally buy happiness. Happiness comes when you stop wanting and desiring and fearing losing everything and just live in the moment. But that's not easy if you don't have money. Money won't make you happy is advice for rich people. Rich people's problems are like, how do I want to spend my time? Who am I really? While everyone else's problems are like, how can I make rent this month? which would be solved if they had more money. They might have new problems in their place, but problems with not nearly the life-threatening severity of the problems of the poor. Let's hear from some of the capitalist clergy directly and see if their free advice really is worth the money we paid for it. We'll start with Milton Friedman. As you might know, Milton is a 20th century economist who remains influential to this day. I think you'll find him both an adherent of imaginary capitalism and, confusingly, a blunt-nosed realist, all in the same article. The Friedman Doctrine. The social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. The discussions of the social responsibilities of business are notable for their analytical looseness and lack of rigor. What does it mean to say that a business has responsibilities? Only people can have responsibilities. In a free enterprise system, private property system, a corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business. He has a direct responsibility to his employers. That responsibility is to conduct the business in accordance with their desires, which generally will be to make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. Anyway, he goes on a bit, but uh, he's right. Executives are employees of shareholders, and their only responsibility is to those shareholders. They can't even speak in public about serious issues unless it's intended to help the share price. Milton's flaw is in assuming this is the right way to organize society. Shareholders are a small, wealthy minority. Why should everything be done for their benefit only? The great difficulty of exercising social responsibility illustrates, of course, the great virtue of private competitive enterprise. It forces people to be responsible for their own actions and makes it difficult for them to exploit 
other people for either selfish or unselfish purposes. Hmm. Well, working for someone else gives you unlimited irresponsibility, actually, because you can blame your boss and orders. And acting on behalf of a corporation gives you legal limited liability, so it's much harder to hold you responsible. So what is Milton talking about here? What's his reasoning? Where's the evidence? They can't exploit people unless the market makes it necessary for those people to get jobs, and then you can exploit them. The political principle that underlies the market mechanism is unanimity. Oh yeah? Did we all agree to participate in the market? I was never asked. Were you? In an ideal free market resting on private property, no individual can coerce any other. All cooperation is voluntary. All parties to such cooperation benefit, or they need not participate. Okay, but we don't live in such a world, and we never will, because the people making money off capitalism would never allow a system with no coercion. <laughs> Who would work for them? There are no social values, no social responsibilities in any sense other than the shared values and responsibilities of individuals. Now, Milton, don't be greedy. Society is a collection of individuals and of the various groups they voluntarily form. Plus the groups we're forced to associate with, like the corporation and the state. The political principle that underlies the political mechanism is conformity. Well, that's true. <laughs> the individual must serve more general social interest, whether that be determined by church or a dictator or a majority or a boss. See? Imaginary. He's not describing capitalism as it is. He's describing imaginary capitalism and how great it would be. And he's doing it to support real-life capitalism, which isn't anything like he's describing. Imaginary capitalism leads to the flourishing of the individual, who can do whatever they like. So obviously there are no states or corporations in imaginary capitalism. Is Milton proposing revolt? In one video, Milton answers the question about greed the same way all capitalists do. He compares authoritarian systems and says the capitalist world clearly lifts people out of poverty better which is tough to prove because of the nebulous nature of what people call socialism. I've rarely heard an advocate of capitalism accurately describe any alternative to it, like socialism, communism, anarchism, participatory economics, worker self-management, decentralized production, mutual aid, and so on. And by the way, contrary to what you've been told and what these people assume, the USSR, China, and so on are not examples of socialism or communism, and are not something to emulate. But confining the limits of debate to what they call capitalism versus what they call socialism makes it easy to win. It's like targeting straw men with reaper drones. Just tell me, where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us? Oh, capitalism has millions of organizers. They're called bosses. And they're not angels. They just get paid more. We don't need anyone to organize society. Society organizes itself. You know, when it gets some time off. Milton's points are in part a reaction to a 1960s counterculture that led to a kind of breaking of the rules of capitalism, or at least a, an imaginary breaking of the rules, and encourage CEOs to be younger, socially responsible, and innovate to save the world. Guys like Elon, who I will definitely get to, can help us pretend our money is saving the planet and contributing to a revolution. 
Milton's core message is actually an antidote to this particular propaganda. Whatever the cool tech bros are doing, their responsibility is to the almighty dollar. It's just Milton and I disagree on the benefits of giving all the money to people who already have all the money. In this next video, Phoebe Buffet's estranged father, Warren Buffet, meets with a couple of his golfing buddies to give a balanced debate on capitalism versus socialism. The idea of people unleashing their potential, using the resources they have to create what we have now from what was here 240-some years ago, it's, 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 it's absolutely a miracle, and you know, what all three of us have seen during our lifetime. And uh, if you compare that with any centralized, planned economy, I, I, you know, I think we win hands down. So like these other guys, Buffett's really just comparing uh, the U.S. to centrally planned economies and says, we win hands down, but he hasn't given any criteria for winning, which means this argument is pretty much just an appeal to patriotism. They don't define capitalism or socialism, but capitalism is obviously superior. It just needs taxes and regulations. So exactly like the system we have today that got these men where they are and keeps the poor where they are. People unleashing their potential is a common refrain among capitalists. I'm not really sure what it means, though. Most people work for someone else, doing whatever work they're told to for most of their lives. If that's their potential, it doesn't say much for humans. I'd say their potential is still on the leash if they have a job, and a pretty short leash knowing most jobs. Unleashing it would be if you let them do what they thought was important. You may notice this discussion on capitalism and socialism doesn't actually have anyone representing socialism. But they don't need one. You see, they're debating imaginary capitalism, which unleashes everyone's potential. So they're debating against the fake socialism of the USSR and its allies, which to them is synonymous with totalitarianism. In any debate between imaginary capitalism and fake socialism, imaginary capitalism wins hands down. Jordan Peterson, the right wing's bravest attempt at an intellectual, wants to praise capitalism, but doesn't get very far. A lot of what he says in his videos on the topic are just a jaunty ramble through the forest of Jordan's mind and have nothing to do with capitalism. He just tells you to suck it up and work hard, because no one's ever told you that before. In one video, he denies that capitalism has to use ever-increasing resources, despite you know, the entire history of capitalism. And he claims there's no starvation, really, except due to politics and poor distribution of resources. Capitalism, in other words. But don't call it that. Call it politics and poor distribution. In this video, Jordan conflates a hierarchy of competence with all kinds of hierarchy. He assumes people make money based on their competence, which he then equates to intelligence, honesty, and hard work. And apparently he's addressing postmodernist arguments here? I'm not sure which ones. He also says a psychopath at the top of a hierarchy couldn't possibly stay in one place for very long because they have to go find new suckers, as if someone in a position of power is just some itinerant con artist. Does he base anything he says on facts? Tony Robbins is like the head cheerleader of capitalism. He must get it, right? In this video, Tony says competition is good because it pushes us to succeed. And that push 
has led to capitalism and all the good things. I've made an entire video on why this is complete baseless garbage, but to nutshell it here, competition is bad for you, whether you win or lose, and it begs the question to say competitive markets for jobs and money are what drive people. We're forced to compete for the scraps the rich toss at us. Tony just regurgitates the same imaginary capitalist arguments, and like the rest of them, he assumes the only alternative anyone could propose is the USSR. In this video, Tony asserts millennials don't save because they don't trust the market, whatever that means. It's not because they don't make enough to save, or that they know they'll never make enough money to retire, or that they know that they have no money-related future because of climate change. And his awesome secret to getting rich and retiring early is save and invest. Hmm. Thanks, Tony. You've turned my life around. I think Tony missed his true calling. He really would be the best junior achievement facilitator ever. I'm guessing the people who pay this guy money also have enough money to save and invest, and enough time to learn how to manage their finances and invest smart and so on, or at least hire an accountant. I just don't know why they pay to hear what they've heard a million times before. It's incredible how many of these videos with millions of views are meandering rants full of jargon that all lead back to the same boring advice. People repeat it like a mantra, work hard, save money, invest wisely, which is why they no longer question it. Same reason they equate money with success. It's just assumed. Most people seem to need to explain things in individual terms. I succeeded due to my own work, rather than the much more powerful social forces like culture and the law. Individuals aren't working hard enough, so there must be some explanation related to them. It couldn't possibly be any other reason. Social forces don't exist in imaginary capitalism, just your own drive to make money. In this video, Tony lends his superficial analysis to understanding business, and claims that the reason 96% of businesses fail is they just don't work hard enough. It's nothing to do with struggling to comply with an ever-changing swamp of regulations, paying onerous taxes, competing with much bigger firms that have the law on their side. No, no, never mind any other explanations or specifics. Businesses fail because the people just aren't committed enough. I think anyone who tells you all you need to do to get rich is want it hard enough. This is, this is the secret. This is self-help nonsense. Not only is it imaginary thinking, but it's the kind of imaginary thinking we teach to little kids. Just believe, and it'll appear. And desperate people will try anything. Oh, and multiple women have accused Tony of sexually harassing them, and he often demeans women who are victims of abuse and rape. Uh, so he's a creep. But he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, so people listen to him. Simon Sinek, or Sinek, I don't know, is a business guy who's always being approached for his advice for some reason. He's great at building himself up by describing young people. He throws around the word leaders when he often just means bosses, CEOs, and owners. Business people love to make the distinction between leaders and bosses to imply they are the former, even though they still have exactly the position, power, and salary of a boss. They just don't like the word. So he talks about leaders. He doesn't mention owners or rent-seeking. 
He claims that millennials are entitled, or they get called entitled, because they were told they were special every day, and given A's they didn't deserve and got on the honor roll despite not deserving to. Stuff about participation medals and so on. You know, the same normal conservative stuff that I've never seen any evidence for, but hey, conservatives say it, so it must be true. And millennials' image is shattered when they realize they can't just have everything they want. Which is weird, because people used to tell me that every day. This is basically the millennials are entitled rant, in a nutshell. People who say these things have, tend to have no facts behind their claims. They talk about the economy as if it were pretty much the same as it was 70 years ago, when some of their advice might have been relevant. See, when you say the same thing everyone else is saying, it starts to sound self-evident. Opinions become facts. Then you proceed from those assumptions to make further conclusions, like it's caused by social media and phones, which Sinek says next in the video. Young people want to have an impact, he says, but they don't know how. Well, here's my message to the same people. You can't have any meaningful impact by working for the system that's causing all the problems. But Sinek and the rest of them say, your purpose in life should be to work for them. The good leaders in their big companies, where you can have an impact by making them rich. I just can see young people now. I can't wait to work for someone else and have an impact on a share price. He talks about how great young people are, but actually he's really patronizing. At the end, he actually claims leaders like him are working really hard to teach millennials the right way to act in business, which includes pretending to be interested in their lives. And you can find a bunch of his speeches on YouTube where he basically says the same points over and over, as if trying to convince himself. It's hard for me to understand why people call this stuff motivational. What does it motivate you to do? Work for Sinek? His assertions about hard work and motivation lay the groundwork for shaming people for not having jobs or homes or just not being rich. It becomes easy to criticize union organizers as just wanting a handout, instead of looking at the huge wealth imbalances between owners and employees or looking into what prompted them to unionize in the first place. We'll come back to unions soon. Gary V is an imaginary capitalist. Out of one side of his mouth, you have to work your ass off. Work your face off? Oh, okay, sorry. Work your face off. If you want to achieve anything worth achieving, and out of the other, own shit, like Bitcoin and NFTs, which takes no work at all. Gary V is the guy all my friends knew in elementary school who urged us to buy baseball cards because they're practically guaranteed to rise in value. Elon Musk is the quintessential imaginary capitalist. He's one of the richest people in the world, on paper, because he's popular. If he wasn't so popular, Tesla's stock price wouldn't be worth 10% of what it is, and his wealth would be a far cry from what the paper says it is. People credit him with being some kind of business genius because he was born into money, got billions of dollars from the government, and magically, incomprehensibly, turned that into even more money. Of course, he's quite a typical capitalist in that way. Show me one rich person at any time or place who didn't get rich by using the state at some point. But people pretend he's got this extreme wisdom and vision that the rest of us just aren't capable of. And that's how he earned billions of dollars. Even right-wing libertarians who claim to oppose the state and any use of that state that would unfree the imaginary free market love Elon. This guy is apparently an editor at Reason who wins the prize for the number of misleading points crammed into a tweet. Musk is not any kind of left-leaning just because he supports the ACLU. People all over the spectrum support the ACLU. 
Liberals and Democrats are not leftists, all wild Republican rhetoric to the contrary. Liberals believe as much as anyone in imaginary capitalism. They just think the imaginary benefits, like a rising tide that lifts all boats, should be more evenly distributed. Now, I can't just debunk everything Elon says. That's what this channel is for. But to say Elon has revolutionized anything is kind of silly. He didn't start Tesla, and he didn't invent electric cars. Cars which, depending on whom you ask, use more carbon to manufacture and emit more over their average lifespan than gas guzzlers. Perhaps the revolution is that people and governments can tell themselves they've chosen the green option, which will somehow reduce emissions and curb climate change. They won't. But people who believe in capitalism and think rich people will save us tell you this kind of thing. I bet any one of you, if you were given billions of dollars, could do way more to fight climate change. Or poverty, for that matter, which I think you'll find Elon promised to do and then quietly backed away. You could criticize his supply chains and the damage they do to the environment. You could criticize that he wanted a coup in Bolivia to secure lithium supplies. You could criticize the environmental impact of his other goofy schemes, like flying to space. You could criticize him for torturing monkeys because he's trying to invent psychic powers. You could criticize his union busting. You could talk about the racism and sexual assault in his factories. You could criticize his firing of whistleblowers. You could criticize his taking credit away from the people who did all the work. You could criticize anyone for being rich when so many other people are poor. And if you were a right-wing libertarian, you could criticize his receiving billions of dollars from the government. My guess is Elon's fans don't listen to legitimate criticism, so they can stay in their bubble, where imaginary capitalism revolutionizes the way we travel by offering an expensive car. His ideas are just automatically considered clever, regardless of how practical they are, or if he ever intends to put them into practice. He just says, Hyperloop, which has been around at least since Futurama, and we're all supposed to go, wow, how did he come up with that? See, that's why he's rich. The real genius of these people has been to convince themselves and the world that they deserve all their wealth and prestige, that regardless of how the system works or how many people work for them, they are the Wonder Boys who provided something essential that probably catalyzed the whole thing, and so they deserve millions or billions as a result, and their workers deserve whatever they're offered. Another aspect of imaginary capitalism is the corporation paints itself as a family. Even if it pays you the minimum and works you over time, it insists you are family. Hmm. As a result, employees need to pretend not only they like working there, like they were always compelled to, but they respect the CEO like a dad. They regard work as just as, a, as an extension of helping themselves in their community contributing to society, and so on. It's a kind of fake egalitarianism, and it mostly exists in PR designed to squash union organizing. Look at what Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz says. The business is a family, and unions are outsiders. Corporations have values they don't need to live by. Howard Schultz, since unionization at over 50 Starbucks locations, put out this heartfelt response, showing how much he loves his employees. We are highly empathic to the root causes of the frustration and anxieties that Gen Z Americans are facing, having come of age during turbulent moments in our history, the 2008 global financial crisis, the Great Recession, and now the global coronavirus pandemic. These young people have completely valid concerns given today's uncertainty and economic instability. They look around and they see the burgeoning labor movement as a possible remedy to what they're feeling. 
I understand the climate and I'm deeply sensitive to the needs of all of our Green Apron partners. Yet, we have a very different and vastly more positive vision for our company based on listening, connecting, and collaborating directly with our people. I'm really concerned about you, really. You're all my highly valued children going out into a harsh world, but unions are bad for me, so shut up and get back to work. You would think if he actually sympathized, he wouldn't fire organizers and shut down stores where unions are attempting to organize. Unions are rigid and old-fashioned and only self-interested, totally not like the corporation. And we're a family, so you're not allowed to negotiate with us collectively. Perfect imaginary capitalist logic. By the way, the solution to capitalism is not just to unionize. The solution is to tear the whole system down and end private ownership. Unions are useful for workers to raise their wages and improve working conditions, but they can't end capitalist oppression on their own. The effect of believing in imaginary capitalism is to legitimize any and all behavior and making and spending of money as long as it falls within the laws made by the people with all the money. These beliefs have led to a world where someone can have everything and right outside their window is someone with nothing and people think it's normal and fine. Where you can get rich by destroying nature, taking away people's jobs and homes, putting people in cages, and the police will protect you and people online will support you. This is an unhealthy world because it's been poisoned by ideology. We have to come, we've, we've come to accept things just the way they are, no matter how bad they get, to ignore all of society's problems and go back to them all. I think we should stop being so complacent and stop ignoring the violence going on and get angry some people will condemn your actions no matter how you resist, but it's a matter of life and death, oppression and freedom, nature or climate catastrophe. We make our choice every day. We can choose differently. We can unite to end this system. Thanks.